This evening, we're very lucky to have John Bielenberg with us. And uh, John is a designer, activist, artist. Well, he's actually, you can't really put him down. He's got a lot of, uh, in fact, he probably wouldn't like me to label him like that. <laughs> but um, what he does best is he helps organizations, and I'm going to read this because I don't want to get it wrong, um, find the courage and the sense of humor to consider uh, whole new strategies for thinking, and, and he calls it wrong ways of thinking, um, and bringing their stories, ideas, and, and innovations out into the world. So he's going to try and help us do that here this weekend, we hope, for any of you who are interested in participating over the course of 48 hours. We have to stay up that whole time, too. We can't, can't go to sleep. Um, <laughs> so... John feels strongly about the value of thinking wrong. He feels so strongly about that that he created a program called Project M, which he's going to tell us about tonight. Um, it's designed to inspire and educate young designers, writers, photographers, filmmakers, biologists, environmental, environmental policy makers. Um, what else do we have in the room? Um, and uh, he, by providing that their work, especially their wrongest thinking, that's hard to say, wrongest thinking, can have a positive and significant impact on the world. Project M has developed projects to help a conservation area in Costa Rica, uh, microfinancing in Ghana, New Orleans after Katrina, the community of East Baltimore, and connecting households to fresh water in Hale County, Alabama, among many other places. Um, in his career, he's won over 250 design awards, was nominated for two national design awards from the Cooper Hewitt Museum, served on the AIGA National Board of Directors, and teaches at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has acquired six of his projects and staged a solo exhibition in 2000. Um, in addition, John is a founding member of C2 Mav Lab and Nada Bike Collective, a member of AGI, which is the Alliance Graphique Internationale, and on the board of Waterfall Arts and Unity College. Um, and most recently, John was awarded the Scandalaris Award for Entrepreneurship and Design from Washington University in St. Louis. So um, with all that said, all that wonderful stuff, um, I'm going to let John really tell you about himself and his interests and Project M. So here's John Bielenberg. Uh, thank you very much, Drew. Let's start this, if we can. Um, as Drew said in the introduction, I, have, I wear a lot of different hats. I, I'm a partner in a company called C2, which is based just south of San Francisco um, with two other partners. And it, C2 stands for Creative Capital. And what we do, even though we're all trained as graphic designers, is really help organizations move from one place to another. And a lot of that is through strategy and idea generation and something we call um, thinking wrong. But I'm not, uh, aside from the world's your worst commute, San Francisco to Maine, um, it's great to be in Maine, and I'm really happy to be here at um, COA. Uh, I think it's a charming institution, and the students I've met are fantastic, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk just specifically about something called Project M, and be whoops. Before I do it, I'll try to make you care about listening to this. And the first reason is that we're all creative um, idiots, or something I call thinking wrong. Uh, I had a client uh, in, the, in my graphic design years called Concord Capital, and they were in the investment business. And I was doing you know, a new identity or something for them. But what I found interesting, they had hired a behavioral psychologist from Cornell to evaluate how other investment managers were victims of their own, they called them heuristic biases. And basically what this is is that our brains are designed to create these synaptic pathways that allow us to make decisions in the world. So. Um, me talking right now. I don't have to think about it. There are these synaptic pathways, so I have a thought and a vocalization. Um, and I started thinking about how, as a, 
as a designer, I was probably a victim of my own heuristic biases. So if I got a project, a new identity or something, I would immediately, I have a file folder in my brain full of um, possible solutions under the category of identity. And I started thinking, well, if I'm um, limiting my thinking like that, are there ways to sort of um, break those orthodoxies? And I call this thinking wrong. So instead of this immediate connection A to B, you generate a lot of different possibilities. And the solution might be R or steaming round thing. Um, I started thinking about how you know, most of us are um, like hardwired to follow these pathways. I think there are some people who are wired differently. Um, this is a guy named Philippe Stark, who's an industrial designer, product designer, and I don't think he tries to think wrong. I just think his brain is hardwired a certain way. Uh, Picasso, I think, was that way as well. Um, the rest of us have to work a little harder at it, and I wear this. Um, rubber band that says live wrong, you can't see it, just as a reminder to me to kind of constantly challenge myself and think wrong. Uh, second reason, a guy named Sambo, Samuel Mockby, who I had the pleasure of meeting at a lecture in San Francisco. He was an architect and teacher. Can you guys see that? It's really dark. Um, at Auburn University, and he founded something called the Rural Studio. Um, here in Hale County, Alabama. So he took architecture students from Auburn, pulled them three hours into Hale County, one of the poorest counties in America, and they would build, well, design, um, fund, and build homes, community centers, baseball parks, all within this area of Alabama. Um, this is a house that was built out of, um, partially out of recycled carpet tiles. So not only were they, they um, engaging in this activity using architecture for um, a social good, but they were really innovative about it and very resourceful about the materials. Um, this is a community center that uses car windshields um, for that side. And this kid found this uh, junkyard in Chicago that on one day in the year, $25, you could haul out everything you could take. And he figured out that the Caprice Classic was the most common car, got all these windshields for 25 bucks. Um, this is one of their dorm rooms. These are the men's dorms, which they built these little pods under this super shed. So what I, I loved about um, what they were doing is pulling these kids out of the academic institution of Auburn, engaging them in, in this real sort of um, uh, amazing endeavor. Um, and I felt like not only was it producing interesting work that served this need, but that these students were forever changed in the process. Um, the third reason is the movie A Beautiful Mind, and it's about this guy, John Nash, who wins the Nobel Prize for Mathematics, but 30 years after he actually did the work in grad school. And I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's a Project M advisor who's a neurologist, and he, he drew this on a napkin where if you're born at zero, at age 18, you're at your physical peak. And he said usually that you think about running fast or lifting a lot of weight, but he said it's also mental kind of processing and robustness, um, and I'm way out on the edge there. Uh, he drew another line he called wisdom and experience, and he said in math and science where you have enough processing power, enough wisdom and experience where they cross was kind of the zone where most of the breakthroughs happened. Einstein came up with E equals MC squared at age 26. Um, I think there's something else going on. I think that it's also a time when your synaptic connections aren't calcified. So you're able to kind of bend and connect things that don't connect. And so this is the area um, between like 20 and 30 that I'm trying to operate right now with Project M. 2003, I had moved to Maine from San Francisco with my wife and two kids, and I started something I call Project M, the M standing for Maine, Mock B, Mentoring, and Messages. Um, this is the first group. 
uh, seven students. They came from all over, um, and we're in Searsport, Maine. Part of Project M, um, well, uh, back up. It's usually, at this point, it was a four-week program in June. Um, and the first part was really about immersion, where I don't want people coming in preloaded with projects or what they're going to do, how they're going to do them. So they just scatter. And two of the guys found this trailer in you know, sort of backwoods Searsport with this outsider art around it. And they knocked on the door. Um, and this woman, Alice Hinckley, came out, 93-year-old outsider artist and invited them in, this is what it looked like. Or, you know, she was just incredibly prolific making um, mostly crap, but really um, creative and generous, and she gave them this doll. She would fold up, um, I think it's a phone book, put a doll head on it, and we just thought that form was really interesting, how when you for, fold something two-dimensional, it becomes three-dimensional, it changes it, but you can still see little pieces of the material that was in it on the fold. So we started folding up all these books and things, just not quite knowing what we were going to do with it. Oh, boy, that's really dark. Um, we ended up doing this book, which is full of black and white photographs that everybody was taking that represented our four weeks together and these little white tick marks on there, when you fold it, um, they become type and they say think wrong. So the, the book became a metaphor for our time together, all those photographs being our experience, and then the actual physical sort of activity of folding these pages was sort of like how thinking wrong is difficult and it changes the form forever once you do it. Um, one big problem that year, was there was really no cause, and I won't go into the reasons for that, but um, unlike the rural studio, I had a very clear cause in fulfilling a need of housing. Um, we had just produced this interesting book. So the next year, 2004, we went to Costa Rica, um, a place called the Guanacosta Conservation Area. This is the group that was there. Um, and this guy you can hardly see was a friend of mine named Dan Jansen, who's a famous scientist who created this conservation area down there. And he was raising an endowment fund. Um, and so we were just down there to do something to help him raise this, uh, this endowment. This is what's happening in Costa Rica. It's this very rich biodiverse area, and they're burning it for pasture land. And the way Dan de describes it, it's like burning books in the library for heat. It's just a really bad use of a rich biodiverse area. It was the rainy season, <clears throat> so the roads looked like this. Um, a lot of Project M is just talking to people. These are uh, Costa Rican parataxonomists, so they, they've trained them um, to make a middle-class income. Um, that's a stinging caterpillar giant cockroach and giant scorpion. Um, and a lot of what we're trying to do is being influenced by our experience. So all the researchers down there had these books called Right in the Rain, which are um, sort of impervious to moisture. And they have plastic covers and wax impregnated paper so they don't fall apart. And we ended up doing this book um, that Dan uses for fundraising which it's a full book of photos and quotes and everything that's going on there, but it's overprinted with a water-soluble black ink. So you actually have to get in the shower to read it. So metaphorically, it's kind of erasing the black from the, the sort of natural Costa Rican rainforest, um, but also replicating our experience during the rainy season. In 2005, um, we did two projects. One was for um, something called the Women's Trust that was doing microfinancing in Ghana. And this is the, we designed a logo for them and they carved the logo, this um, uh, African symbol into potatoes and printed that. Um, these are the t-shirts. So that's the identity we did. The other project was really kind of bizarre. Um, and I won't go into all the details, but one of the kids makes a demolition derby car every year for the Skowhegan State Fair. 
And we just thought that was crazy and silly and ended up wanting to take a road trip. And so we, ended, we bought a used ambulance in Camden and outfitted it as a rolling design studio. Our original idea was to do this mentoring project where we would go around the country. We um, changed it completely after Katrina and ended up going down to New Orleans um, and picking up supplies from Maine to New Orleans, uh, printers, computers, paper, um, for designers who had lost everything um, and ended up packing the ambulance getting down to New Orleans and then distributing it down there. Um, next year, we went to East Baltimore. Uh, this is the group in Portland, actually. And East Baltimore is one of these areas, I don't know if you've ever seen The Wire, but it's one of these areas of an industrial city that has lost its economy, in this case, steel, and has left you know, this uh, devastation in its path. Um, and so what we were doing there was looking for positive things. So they're suffering from, you know, gangs and drug use and syphilis and prostitution and Ill illiteracy. But we are looking for, you know, what are the positive things we can support? Um, one of which are these um, areas of crack houses. They bulldozed and they put in these little parks, um, very modest green sections. Here's a little Zen garden. But what what happens is it has a transformative effect on the neighborhood. So they start picking up the trash, the drug dealers move away, um, and we were just really inspired by that. So we thought, well, let's raise some money, um, do a fundraising campaign, um, and what if we do a book that you can actually plant? So it raises money, but then you have the big event where people actually plant the books and make a park out of it. Um, we did a lot of tests trying to get these things to grow, and they ended up just kind of leaving trash, and it didn't work very well. Um, this is another idea where we were just trying to green the um, environment. We didn't do that. We ended up doing this book, which is full of postcards that you, you actually pull all these postcards out, which say, this is not grass.com and send them out to raise money to bring people to this website. But the cool thing about the book is when you pull all the postcards out, it reveals the message, this is hope. So it's, it's not grass, it's hope. Um, 2007 was a real pivotal year for us. I had met this woman, Pam Dorr, who was part of the rural studio and now is living in rural Alabama. <clears throat> and she invited us to come down there Here's some of the group down there. So for me, it was really rewarding to go down to this area of Alabama where the rural studio was, which inspired me to start Project M in the first place. Um, Greensboro, Alabama is very similar in some ways to where I live in Belfast. It was once really prosperous um, with cotton plantations, and then it went through um, sort of a pretty quick um, erosion of that industry and then got into chicken processing. All of that's gone. Unlike Belfast, there's been no tourism. There's no retirement. There are no people moving there. So this is around the back of Main Street, sort of kind of eroding from within. Um, so in our process of discovery, we found out that in communities like this in Hale County, um, people uh, quarter of the households are not connected to fresh water. Um, this is hard to see, but they're on these shallow wells that are contaminated with sewage because there are no septic systems. It just goes in the ground. So we did a campaign called Buy a Meter where we found out it cost $425 to buy water meters, get the guy out to hook them up. Um, and this is the piece we did. Um, Oh, good, you can see it. So this a uh, newsprint, tabloid-sized newsprint piece on the cover. It says Oprah has one. So does Paris Hilton. Charles Manson uses one every day. Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani have one. Frank Lloyd have one. And you have one, too. So this whole front section was just kind of this teaser to get people in, engaged in the piece. 
um, but Herbert Banks doesn't. These are real people in Hale County. Neither do Jackie and Damien Green. In Hale County, water's not a right. It's actually not a right anywhere in the U.S., but um, one in four households, it costs 425 um, help a family buy a meter, some info about it, and then a website. So um, that was really successful. We raised about $40,000, hooked up over 100 families so far. Um, we're done with that piece of it, and we had a guy come down um, who was one of my advisors from New York, and he said, you know, Never underestimate the desire of wealthy people to consume and pacify their guilt at the same time. And so we thought that was really interesting and printed up these t-shirts that had 425 on them and sold them for $425 each. Um, this is a wealthy friend of mine wearing his t-shirt on safari. And we raised probably $20,000 with those t-shirts. I, th I think it's a really interesting idea. Instead of saying donate $425, get a free T-shirt, buy a $425 T-shirt. Um, 2008, this is the group. We went down to Alabama again because it was so um, rewarding and successful. And these are mostly graphic designers um, this year. And what they did was carpentry and construction um, they decided to convert this building, which we were given um, for free, into a permanent design lab in Alabama. Um, and I was really proud of them because none of them had any experience doing stuff like this. They built the sink and the chandelier, and um, it's really quite a wonderful space. They did a campaign. We printed up these T-shirts with, or, I mean, posters with wrong on the back, backwards, so you turn it around and you can see the wrong through it. Um, we printed t-shirts with wrong printed inside um, and then made these gorilla packages and we sent these out to students all over the country at design schools and they did these gorilla postings of these so that the whole purpose of this was to get young designers to come down to Alabama to work at the lab. Um, 2009, What's happened in the last few years is it, it's gone from just a month program in the summer to um, I think last year I did six or seven of these things. It's just exploding because of the demand. And I think it's two things. One is Project M is um, getting more publicity so more people know about it. I give more talks. But I think it's also about this uh, anxiety over the future, um, especially with young people where we're grappling with you know, climate change, peak oil, deforestation, species extinction, the rise of the middle class in China and India that wants all the crap we have. Now we have finan global financial collapse. So in this you know, kind of tumultuous place we're in with these global tipping points, I think young people increasingly are engaging wanting to engage in work that matters, you know. Um, and so we've been doing more and more. Um, this is a project we did where we were trying to get young people, really 20 to 30 in urban areas, onto bikes for everyday transportation. Because in urban areas, if you've ever been to Copenhagen or Amsterdam, bikes are just a great way to get around cities. Um, and so we were trying to create this movement called Not a Bike which is just about using bikes. So the actual bikes, oh, here's the website. It's almost more, it's not a bike company. It's really sort of a membership of people who agree um, to participate in this movement. So the bikes, you do, well, let me back up. You, it's $100 to join NADA, and your membership card is a bike frame, which, Oh, there's some not a members, which looks like this. So you get this raw steel bike frame in the mail with your member number on it, and then it's all about how you build it up. So there's no logo, there's no marketing, there's no real company behind this. Um, this is mine. And we actually suggest that you leave it unpainted and just kind of let it rust gradually over time. Um, some people do paint them. And these are really simple. They're called fixed gear or single speed bikes that are really easy to maintain. Um, 
and everybody does it completely differently. We're getting the um, frames from Taiwan right now to enable us to get them cheap enough to sell them for $100. But our eventual plan is to build them ourselves out of bamboo. And we're working with a group called Bamboo Bike Studio in Brooklyn um, to create a bamboo bike um, fabrication facility in Alabama. Um, because this, this bamboo grows wild all over the place down there. Um, another project we did last year was we bought a shipping container. And these things are piling up in the US because what happens, all this crap comes from China and we're not exporting nearly as much stuff. So these shipping containers, it doesn't make any sense to ship them back empty. So they're just stacking up and you can get them relatively cheaply. And the neat thing about them is they're incredibly structural. You can cut them up, you can do all kinds of things with them. Um, what we did was we painted it all white um, and put this wall in the back and we call it blank lab. And our idea is to create this mobile studio that we um, haul around the country and do projects, either Project M projects, a bamboo bike workshop. Um, and we got this truck, uh, which was a used ambulance for free and put a flatbed on it and put the tr uh, trailer or the shipping container on the trailer, um, took it up to Rhode Island. There was a conference called the Better World by Design at RISD, and we brought the blank lab up there, set it up like a photo studio, and then had everybody sign this uh, contract to do something meaningful with their life, put their name, email, and city on it, and then we gave them a t-shirt, um, it says Engage Transform on it and took their picture in the blank lab. Um, truck broke down, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, and so we're creating this big community of all these young people who have agreed to do something and then we'll mobilize them on different projects. Um, this is a group, hard to see, um, in Maine last March. and. One of the things we do at Project M, we go around and everybody kind of tells a hidden talent or passion. And this girl, Rosanna, was really into pie. Her whole family's into pie, baking it, eating it. And so we did this event in Belfast called Free Pie. So this was last March, shortly after this big financial collapse. It's March in Maine, people are depressed. And so this was just kind of a gesture to the community to bring people together. They designed it, promoted it, baked the pies. And it was so successful. We got press and you know, people were just talking about this really simple thing that these young people were doing. They um, then went on and invented something called Pie Lab. Um, and went down, these are, so after the two week program in Maine ended, these kids, w some of them went down to Alabama, took over half our Project M lab and opened something called Pi Lab. Um, and they built it for $600 of materials. So, you know, like the rural studio, I like that they have to be really resourceful with no money. And the brilliant piece of this, it sounds kind of frivolous, but in this part of Alabama, the, the black and white communities are really separate. Um, and you'll never have the black, the black churches are separate, black restaurants are separate. So this was a neutral space that um, encouraged a, a mixing of the, the different communities in Hale County. Um, you can see this older white woman there and this black family coming in. Um, and what I think is really interesting about Pie Lab, not only just bringing community in, but then mashing the young designers and Project M kids with the community um, that then inspires the projects that they do. Uh, Pie Lab was so successful in our little studio, we got a space on Main Street, which is this, um, and opened up a more permanent pie lab. This is probably six months ago. Um, this is what the space looked like when we got it. And we built um, 
totally renovated it, built these walls out of recycled um, wood that we were given. And they're actually on wheels and you can move them around. Um, built the table out of reclaimed wood. This is what it looks like now. Um, and so it's a functioning pie and coffee shop in front, but we also do training with um, these GED students. Called, it's a program called Youth Build, training on pie baking, running restaurants. Um, and then in the back of the space back here, um, we have a fully functioning design studio and business incubator. So it's sort of like a, a weird, interesting mix of, of creative studio, business incubation, and restaurant and cafe. Um, that's the outside. There's a poster we did. Um, like I said, we, a, more and more Project M's are happening, and I did one, um, this is in rural Connecticut with a group. Um, it, it was in Hale County, or parts of Maine, it's really easy to find projects. This part of um, Connecticut is relatively affluent, so we struggled a little bit on, on figuring out our project, but one of the things that they have is a, a lot of small farms producing um, really good quality local, local um, meat and vegetables and produce. Um, this guy, Dimitri, who's an engineer from MIT, was really into grilling, like grilling anything. And one of the things he grills are pizzas. And so we ended up doing something we call Pizza Farm, where they produce this event to really promote all the local farms and get people um, to acknowledge that that resource is there. Printed up t-shirts, had balloons, promoted it, and then got all this um, produce and organic sausage, and we, even the dough for the pizza was all locally made, and had this event. About 400 people came. Um, they got their dough and then picked all their toppings, and then Dimitri grilled it. Um, and now that they've actually established a permanent farmer's market in that space that we had the pizza farm in. Um, this is a group in Detroit. We did a project there. Detroit, you guys probably all know, is really suffering. It's like the big version of Hale County, Alabama. This is an auto body plant that's ab abandoned. Um, there are some interesting things happening. This is something called the Heidelberg Project, which is really using art in this little community or little neighborhood in Detroit to kind of change, you know, sort of the dynamic of what's happening. Um, this was one of the Project M guys who walked into this really sketchy area of Detroit one day, and he was taking pictures, and this guy came out, I think I have a picture of him, yeah, right there, named Chet, and he goes, dude, you know, put away your camera, you're going to get killed, and they started talking and ended up coming to hatching this project. This is right across from Chet's house. It's just these vacant lots where they have, they bulldozed houses. Um, and they ended up, find, they found out that the horseshoes is like a really big thing in Detroit. And they ended up building these horseshoe pits out of the just wood that they found, paint they found. And I'll show a little um, video about this when I'm done. And what, what's really cool about this, it's, it's not really even about design. You know, it's just about connecting to a community, figuring out a project, figuring out how to do it, and it can really have um, a transformative impact. It's called Plot 63. So just like Pi Lab, the free Pi event became Pi Lab. Plot 63 could be something that they take other places in Detroit or other cities in the country. Um, I realized in my desire to have as much impact as possible with Project M, there would only be a certain number of people that could go through the Project M session itself. So we invented this thing called the Blitz, which is how can you do a Project M project in 48 hours? What does that look like? Um, here's a group that came down from Atlanta. So this is in um, Alabama. And they did a project called Hail Hero where they were really promoting some of the heroes in this community. Um, 
It's a group from East Ball or from Mica, Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, um, who did a project about empowerment through housing. A lot of the people in this community never even imagined that they could own a house. So they did these posters that were a teaser to a bigger campaign. Um, I went to Iceland last February and with the Icelandic Academy of the Arts did a blitz project with them and I'll show some of them um, in a second. This was in a time in Iceland where they were going through this complete financial collapse and political upheaval. So it was a really interesting time to be in Iceland. And their blitz project was to do something in the public realm that's a response to the economic and political um, upheaval. And I'll, I'll show the video from this rather than talk about it. Um, they did a public kind of performance uh, showing all their projects right before I left. Um, and it was in this beautiful theater right on the edge of Reykjavik. The parliament building is right across the street from this. And what I thought was so interesting is that this, they burned this giant M in, uh, it was a frozen pond out there, right beside the parliament where they had overthrown the government five days before. And the police came down the street, looked out their window and drove on, you know? I just couldn't imagine that happening outside the Capitol here. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is something called MavLab where I'm trying to take Project M and kind of um, embedded into C2 and the work that I do actually for money. This is our studio on the coast of California. Um, it's a passive solar building. It's made out of this kind of translucent plastic, kind of interesting. Um, this is a identity for MavLab where we had all these designers do logos and then just took them all and mashed them together. Um, and what, we're, what MavLab is, is about gathering these very diverse groups of interesting people together around topics. Um, oh, these, it's so hard to see, but some of these guys are from Google. There's an artist there, an entrepreneur. So really kind of diverse, interesting, creative people. Um, this is a, a project funded by Adobe um, where we were trying to kind of grapple with the brand of sustainability. So you, you look at the sustainability and it's problematic in several ways. One is it's so hard to define what it means. The more you talk about, the more connected everything is. People don't really know what it is. Um, if, if anything, it's connected to the environmental movement, which marginalizes it. Um, it's not an aspirational word. You don't go out and say, you know, Ross, go out and sustain, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it just sounds like you're maintaining the status quo. Um, and so this was a 48 hour project where we gathered people together and invented this character we called Greeny the Bear. Um, and Greeny has a children's television show about sustainability, but behind the scenes, he's just massively pissed off. Um, <laughs> And that's his tagline, poop is food. And we ended up producing this YouTube video of behind the scenes with Greeny, where he's just incredibly pissed off about the state of the world. The purpose was really to get like college age kids, you know, through kind of irreverent humor to try to get this viral video. And then um, it hasn't really happened, but to be continued. Um, and that's it, thank you. So I want to show a couple videos, um, I think, which will help illuminate this. The first one is about the Plot 63 project. And this, I, I laugh because it was produced by Fox News of all people, but they did a really nice job of capturing the effect of this horseshoe pit. So let's see. As the city of Detroit battles a budget crisis, staggering unemployment, a crippling crime rate, and an image of corruption, 
one local neighborhood has found an outlet, and it's come in the most unexpected way, a game of horseshoes. Fox 2's Brad Edwards with the story. In Detroit, in a pocket where it's street lights out, where water flows from century-old brick homes, where death, this one buried this day, is worn on t-shirts. Five zip. Get away through the pink door. You like throwing shoes? I want to. It's a nice place for everybody to come together. Some, that's somewhere between the borderline. This is uh, an empty lot that uh, the state of Michigan now owns. Jason, a U of M mechanical engineer, he and a few other intrepid young designers came, canvassed, built, and they came. Add it up, uh -oh. add it up. All this stuff was found, different dumpsters, different lots in the city, different torn down houses. No, no. All right, go, go ahead. And the horseshoe pit gravel from the old Tiger Stadium. Shh. Uh, Community building, urban renewal, words politicians oh use God. as platforms, guys not running for anything and not running from Detroit actually did in days. You know, there's all these vacant lots in the city. Let's create a space that the community can use. And the door? You walk into this plot and you have to respect it. My man, brought everybody together. Brought everyone together. It seems like. We like to come out and just watch them every day. You see. Narnia? Nah, but it is, says the neighborhood's doyen, its elder, Miss Bernadette. Oh, hey! This horseshoe park is the best thing that's ever happened to our community in years. One plot at a time. Plot 63. Check. Brad Edwards, Fox 2. The volunteer designers are part of Project AmLab. Now, if you'd like more information about the group, we'll put a link to their site on MyFoxDetroit.com. Let me, I want to show one more here. <clears throat> um, and this is um, one of the Iceland Blitz projects. Um, <clears throat> what was interesting in Iceland um, was, you know, that there was this, uh, you know, thing happening, you know, that was very, you know, tumultuous in that, um, in their community, um, and that they had these 48-hour projects. We said you have to document, not only do you have to do your project in 48 hours, you have to document it in a 48-second video. Um, and so there were eight groups of five. This is one of them. Um, the, let's see. I'll just play it, and then I'll talk about it. Hópur fólk sem kallar sig 12-7 mótmælir í dag í matvörubúðum krónunar vegna hækkandi matvöruverðs. Hópurinn fer í allar verslanir krónunar á höfuborgarsvæðinu og merkir þar vörur með límmiðum sem vísa til 12,7 prósenta hækkunar vöruverðs í búðinni. Miðað við verðkönnuna ESI sem gerð var eftir bankarhunnið í lok oktober í fyrra hefur verð hækkað mest í krónunni eða um 12,7 prósenta meðaltali. Hækkun í bónus og netto var um 8 prósenta tímabilinu en minnst hefur verð hækkað í nóatúni eða um 1,2 prósent. So, um, you could probably tell from that, what they did was they printed up these stickers that say 12.7 percent increase, and then started sticking them on stuff, but they also alerted the newspapers, the TV stations, and they got press all, everyone in Iceland knew about this project, and I just thought it was such a brilliant idea um, to in 48 hours, how do you get every single person in Iceland aware of this radical increase in food pricing, you know, and I, I just was really inspired by that. Um, let me show one more of those. And this one is kind of bizarre, but it, um, it, it's so crazy, and that's what I love about it. Um, it w in the, the early stages of one of these blitzes, we do something called thinking wrong. And 
we assign random words to these groups that they use as a starting place. So this group got wind chime as their kind of random words. And so they, they kind of use that as a place to jump off of. So you have financial political collapse and wind chime, and this is what they did. And remember, it's 48 hours, so 24 hours to come back to class, present what they wanted to do, and they did all of the rest of this in, in the other 24 hours. And they could have gotten killed doing it. What that was about, those four people represented four of the politicians who were responsible for this. But I love that they were able to kind of execute that so quickly. So there are more, but that's all I'll show for now. <laughs> 